Jeremiah chapter 18, please. In your sword. Familiar passage of Scripture. I promise I'll do my very, very best to do it justice as we look into the potter's house today. Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning at verse number 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. I wonder if you have a different version of the Bible. Instead of the word marred, do you have a different word for marred? Spoiled. Spoiled is a good word. Spoiled. 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 Anyone else? Most of you have the authorized version of the King James, which is godly in and of itself. Uh, was marred, spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Then it gets interesting. At what instant, or at any moment, I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to tear it up from its roots, to pull it down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced this curse turned from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at that instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build it up and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, and it does no longer obey my voice, then I will repent of the good that I was going to benefit that nation or kingdom. And then the last two verses, 11 and 12. Now therefore go, Jeremiah, speak to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, this is what the Lord's saying, Judah, behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return to me, every one of you from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings right and good. But they said, there is no hope for us. We will walk after our own devices. We will, every one, do the imaginations of his evil heart. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. What a message you gave Jeremiah, Father. Not only was it a word for Judah before the Babylonian captivity, about 570 B.C., but it's a word for this nation, this world, this country, and yes, even this church. In July of 2022, <clears throat> Father, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears, that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In your name I pray, amen. I wish I could claim authorship for this. I can't. It was written by Dr. Bob Moorhead. I can claim part of it, the Dr. Bob part, but he messed up with his last name on it. It's called The Paradox of Our Age. You know, every time I, I hear or see the word paradox, I remember a cartoon I saw with two ducks walking away from it's wildly, it was a paradox. Par paradox. Do I, I'm, see, I have to explain it to the bolder people. It's, it's, a, it's a par paradox. I'm sorry, that just, that just cracks me up. So Dr. Bob said this about the paradox of our age. We have taller buildings, 
but shorter tempers. We have wider freeways, but na narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but we have less. We buy more, but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses, but smaller families. We have more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less common sense. More knowledge, with less judgment. More experts, but somehow we have more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry too quickly, we stay up too late, get up too tired, pray too seldom, and watch way too much TV. Amen? amen. You're allowed to say amen. That, may, that, that, that may, makes me know you're awake out there. <laughs> We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk way too much, love too seldom, and lie too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not how to make a life. We've added years to life, but not life to our years. We've been to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've split the atom, but not our prejudices. We write more, but we learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We have higher incomes, but lower morals. More food, but less appeasement. More acquaintances, but fewer true friends. We have more effort, but less success. These are the times of fast foods and slow digestion. Tall man and short character. Steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the times of world peace, but domestic warfare. More leisure, but less fun. We have more kinds of food, but less nutrition. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce. Fancier houses, but broken homes. These are the days of quick trips, disposable diapers, and throwaway morality. These are the days of one night stands, overweight bodies, and pills that do everything from cheer us up to quiet us down to even kill us. <clears throat> it is a time when there is much in the show window, but nothing in the stock room. Today, many want to gain the world at the mere expense of their immortal souls. Evil is contemplated and performed with both hands, yet we cannot lift a finger for our fellow man. May God have mercy on our souls. Pray without ceasing. Let each of us examine our own ways. Solomon said, there's a way that seems right to a man, but what are the ends of that way? Death. We tried everything our way. We've, we've made even religion a Burger King, having your way religion. If you don't want to get with the, if you don't want to follow the thou shalt, then just do what you want to do. And you can hear that message in churches everywhere today. The last thing we want to do is make you feel bad about yourself. Now, feeling bad about yourself for just the sake of feeling bad about yourself is not a positive thing. It's not a good thing. But if it's that C word that ends with unviction, conviction, that's something to take notice of. Because that's a work of the Holy Spirit, not man. Amen? I read to you a, a portion of scripture that the first part is pretty well known. The potter's house. Jeremiah was 14 years old when he started his ministry. And he had a rough job. He was a prophet of doom, of gloom. 
There's a reason why he was called the weeping prophet. His own brother even stole his fiancée from him while he was out preaching. Who would do such a thing? He was the weeping prophet. As a matter of fact, he wrote all of the book of Jeremiah, and he also wrote the following book, the book of Lamentations, which is a, an epitaph of how great the city of Jerusalem once was before it fell to, to the captivity. Nebuchadnezzar wiped it out. And all who pass by <coughs> wag their heads and lament the glory that once was. Does anyone here remember the past glory of the church? Does anyone recall what the church used to look like? Je uh, Jeremiah played Monty Hall and let's make a deal. He said, Judah, this is the deal. Behind curtain number one, I have blessings for you. I have blessings so bountiful that you wouldn't be able to hold them all. They're waiting for you. Curtain number one. Choose curtain number one. I have all these blessings, all those prayer requests that you've been praying for for decades. I can make them happen. Choose curtain number one. I also have curtain number two, which contains a curse. Monty Hall, or whoever, I forget who the new guy was on Let's Make a Deal, does a really good job, cracks me up. But they never said what was behind the curtain. Jeremiah did. Jeremiah said, here it is, guys, behind curtain number one, blessings beyond measure. Beyond curtain number two is a curse that will destroy you, your children, and your children's children. Choose wisely. I believe the King of Kings, our potter, sits with us today. And he says, church, choose wisely. I have before you an open door. I have blessings untold, priceless blessings. Amen. You need healing? That's behind curtain number one. You want a touch of the master's hand? That's curtain number one. You want to be loved beyond measure? That's curtain number one. You want to experience my wrath and my justice and my judgment? That's curtain number two. It's up to you. It's always been up to us. That's what free will is all about. That's what Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 is all about. Free will. As a pastor, I stand before you today begging all of us at Broomfield Community Church to choose curtain number one. Doesn't that make common sense? I know common sense in our country has pretty much left the building. Yeah. I've never seen it like this. I mean, there have been times and situations where, where'd that come from? You know? Uh, like, out of your, you're kind of blindsided by it. But never in my life have I noticed it to be illegal for schools to hand out Tylenol to children, but it's okay for sex changes. What's wrong with our country? We've chosen curtain number two. As a nation, we've chosen curtain number two. That's what they did. Verse number 12, and they said, Jeremiah, stop your preaching. There is no hope for us. So we're going to walk in our own vain, wicked, vile imagination. That's what judges said. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So here we are, church. The potter is working a work on the wheel. It's called Broomfield Community Church. It would be really easy to preach about a nation who's gone AWOL from God. That, that would that'd be too easy. So I want to narrow it down a little bit. 
Not from a huge nation. Not 50 states with all the senators and representatives. I, I want to narrow it down to this little, little church in Broomfield, Colorado. Ouch. Yeah. Kind of painful, isn't it? Because God set before us a beautiful open door. And he has all these blessings waiting. But we're, we're choosing a different route. By we, I mean Christianity in general. The church is almost unrecognizable in some circles today. It's not what she used to be. But my Bible says Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride. Having no spot, no blemish, no impurities at all. So what has to happen to the church for that to happen? Can I say it starts with an R and ends in revival? <laughs> Do you think that may be a wise step to the blessings of God? A revival, a renewal, a restoration? I was thinking, I had my, my limousine driver drive me to church today. And I was thinking, what if, what if, Bobby, this is your last message you ever preach? What if something goes wrong Wednesday morning and the surgeon says, oops? They don't accept it. I know my surgeon doesn't speak English. <laughs> I don't know what it would sound like in his language. Uh, what if this is my last time I ever got to preach? What would I preach on? What would be my topic? What would be my theme? What would be my passion? What would be my love? What keeps me awake at night besides cashews or pepperoni pizza? The state of God's church. We need it, church. We need we need, and let me change that personal pronoun from being collective to one pronoun, me, I, myself. I need his move in my life. How about you? Do you know why? Can I tell you why? It's even biblical. Because I've been marred in the hand of the potter. The potter had a beautiful vision of what that vessel should look like. But as Jeremiah was watching the potter spin that wheel and create that vessel, the Bible says the potter noticed that the vessel was marred in his hands. He didn't drop it. He didn't lose track of it. He didn't step on it. He held the vessel in his hands and it was broken. It was seared. It was contaminated. It was worthless. Still with me? Because we are human beings, we are that vessel. And I'm so glad my King James Bible says so the potter just threw it in the trash. Not even the King James says that. My Bible says he made it over again, as seemed good for the all of our impurity. I did, I did a word search in Hebrew. Oh, you're going to be so proud of me. I actually did my homework for a change. I'm looking at my notes. This is so unusual. The word marred. And the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. This is what that means. Decayed. Ruined. Corrupt. Spoiled. <coughs> disfigured and wasted. That's what the potter held in his hand. That's me. That's me without Jesus Christ. Without the Lord in my heart, I am all of that. 
I am I'm ugly. I'm disfigured. I'm spoiled. I'm wasted. I'm corrupted. Without Christ, that's me. But with Christ, as the potter creates a beautiful work on the wheel, he creates something beautiful. Something good. That's our God. We do have a great, big, wonderful God. I was looking through, I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 3 as we close in just a moment. Let's turn there now. It's the last book of the Bible, right before the book of Concordance. Thank you, Lou. Revelation chapter 3, please. I believe we're living in the Laodicean church age. It's the last of the church ages. There are <coughs> churches like Ephesus around today that have left their first love. There are churches like Sardis and Thyatira and Philadelphia. But more than any of them, I believe we're living in the last day, the last minutes of the last hour of the age of time. And so I want to read to you a story of the Laodicean church. Verse number 14 of chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. To the church of Laodicea he writes, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Oh, how I wish you were one or the other, either cold or hot. So then because you're only lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Wow, that's quite an indictment against any church. Because in your eyes you say, I'm rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And you have no idea that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So here's my counsel to you, church. Buy from me gold, purest gold, tried in the refiner's fire, that you may literally become rich. And put on white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness will no longer appear. And by the way, anoint your eyes with the eye salve that made you all so wealthy to begin with that you may finally see. As many as I love, I rebuke, I chasten. So be zealous, therefore, church, and repent. Repent. The church today has built bigger, it's the paradox of the age. We have bigger buildings, but less love inside those buildings. You have to really do a search to find a church that is still old-fashioned enough to preach heaven sweet and hell hot. Most churches won't mention hell anymore. It's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. As a matter of fact, <coughs> hell hath enlarged herself since the last time you heard a message about it. I was so arrogant. When I was a young preacher, I would preach and pound the pulpit and yell at the top of my lungs, and you deserve to go to hell, and blah, blah, blah. I can't do that anymore. Because there may be people in this very room who know all about God up here. You've been to Sunday school, you've memorized scripture, you've even memorized the toughest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, and you know exactly what it said. What does it say? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And you know it. You know John 3.16. You know the 23rd Psalm that we just sang about. I mean, that's the problem. We have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. 
We're 17 inches away from spending eternity with Jesus Christ. That's called the gospel. The good news is that Jesus loves you. Wow. The creator of all the universe actually loves you. He knows you by name. He has every hair on the top of your head numbered. For some of you, that's quite an undertaking. Not so much for me. But he knows you. He, you know what? He knows those private sins of yours. They're not private to him. He knows them. And he loves you anyway. That's why verse 20 of Revelation chapter 3 is such a beautiful verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever opens the door and invites me in, I will come and have dinner with him, sup with him, and he with me. Behold, Jesus stands at the door of our church and knocks, and he says, Hello, anybody home? I'm here. That's right. <laughs> right on cue. That is one trained dog. Wow. If you've ever been to their house, if you ring the doorbell or knock, Heidi goes ballistic. So I knocked and she cares she picked up on it. Perfect. We spent hours planning that. <laughs> he stands at the heart, the, the door of your heart, and knocks. And he says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna break this door down. I don't have a key. You've got to unlock it from the inside and let me in. And so much, so many of us, we've got it all up here, but not down here. Romans 10, 13, one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a verse. What a What am I saved from? Hell. It's still there. I, I love people. I don't believe in hell. Well, that doesn't change the temperature one degree. It's still real. I don't want you to go there. It won't be heaven without you. Let me put it that way. Amen? Amen. He's still working on his church. And he's put before us a choice. Free will. I love free will, but it gets me in trouble all the time. He says the same thing in Deuteronomy. I've set before you an open door. Choose life or choose death. But choose. I want you to choose life. Isn't that what Jesus said that he is? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through the life of the Son. Choose him. But now that the Lord's got you, He's saying, what are you going to do with me? <clears throat> I literally shed my last drop of blood for you because I love you. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Someone had to do it. Someone perfect. Someone pure. Someone sinless. His name is Jesus. And that same Jesus stands outside your heart's door and knocks and says, Hey, here I am. What are you going to do with me? Are you going to let me in? Or are you going to keep that door shut? It's in your hands.